Doings of Doyle is sponsored by Belanger Books, home of the best Sherlock Holmes anthologies featuring today's top Sherlockian authors. Belanger Books is the only authorised publisher of Solar Ponds Mysteries, continuing the Sherlock Holmes legacy into the 21st century. Visit them today at belangerbooks.com. Welcome to Doings of Doyle, a podcast dedicated to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Professor Challenger, Brigadier Gerard, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. I'm Mark Jones. And I'm Paul Chapman. And together we'll be exploring Doyle's eclectic bibliography to understand more about the great man's life and work. We'll be discussing his fiction and non-fiction, the well-known and the obscure. And stopping by Baker Street along the way. You can find out more at doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doingsofdoyle on Twitter. Hello and welcome to episode 17. This time we have a slice of Anglo-Indian Gothic with Conan Doyle's early short story, Uncle Jeremy's Household, published in 1887. And here's Paul to set the scene. While studying for his final exams, medical student Hugh Lawrence receives an invitation to stay with an old student friend, John H. Thurston, at his ancestral home of Dunkelthwaite in the Yorkshire Fells. He accepts with some reluctance, and upon arrival is introduced to a strange household, which includes Thurston's uncle Jeremy, an elderly amateur poet, who is always accompanied by his sinister secretary, Copperthorne. Also present are Jeremy's infant nephew and niece, and their exotic Anglo-Indian governess, Miss Warrender. Lawrence soon detects an air of mystery around the governess and the secretary, and ultimately discovers a deadly plot involving one of India's most murderous sects. Uncle Jeremy's Household was written around May 1885, at which time Conan Doyle was a struggling GP in practice in Southsea and writing to compensate for his meagre income. He had a number of works out in the early half of the year. There was The Man from Archangel came out in January 1885 uh, and The Lonely Hampshire Cottage in May. And his comic short story, The Great Kineplatz Experiment, was uh, published in July He was halfway through writing his first novel, The Firm of Girdleston, which he'd actually begun the previous year. And he was equally busy in his personal life. Earlier that year, he was busy writing his uh, MD thesis, which was submitted in March. He also met Louise Hawkins, to whom he was engaged in April, and they actually married in in August that year. And again, somewhat relevant to this story, his father um, was in decline, uh, having moved from Blerano House to Montrose Royal Mental Hospital for continued treatment for his alcoholism and and related problems in May. So we have this picture of a young man starting to make his way in general practice and writing and on the verge of settling down. As for Uncle Jeremy's household, on the 18th of May 1885, Conan Doyle wrote to his mother, my thug story finished, but any hints of the doctors can be interpolated in clean copy. Um, The doctor in question was the Doyle's former lodger in Edinburgh, Brian Charles Waller, of whom more later. Uh, Conan Doyle then submitted the story to Blackwoods, which had long been the focus of his literary attentions. Um, There's a somewhat fawning submission letter, which is quoted in Andrew Lysett's biography, in which Conan Doyle suggested this story might be found worthy of a place in their pages, uh, and that though he'd been published by Cornhill, Temple Bar, and others, he had yet to have the, quote, good fortune to be published by Blackwood. But alas, he was to be unlucky again. The manuscript was returned on the 10th of August, um, four days after he was he was married to Louise. And there is a note in the Blackwood archive that suggests perhaps one of the reasons for the rejection was the length of the story. The note, which appears to be a sort of editorial aside, uh, reads, the story is a little long, but it is divided in the centre so as to be capable of being re- continued. I think that anyone who read the first half would wish to read the second, but nevertheless, they still elected not to publish. Uh, In fact, it it wouldn't be until 1890 when Blackwoods published The Physiologist's Wife, and Conan Doyle wrote in Memories and Adventures that he'd finally penetrated the stout Scottish barrier of Blackwoods. The story was eventually taken by the um, somewhat more downmarket paper, The Boy's Own Paper, uh, and serialised in seven parts between the 8th of January and the 19th of February 1887, a good 18 months after the story was written, by which time Conan Doyle was getting much more into the swing of writing. Uh, He once told 
a meeting of the Authors Club that after my marriage, my brain seems to have quickened and both my imagination and my range of expression uh, were greatly improved. Um, and in fact, Uncle Jeremy's Household was one of the last stories he wrote before his marriage. In, f- in fact, it probably was the last thing he wrote before his marriage. And one of the first stories he wrote after was, of course, uh, A Study in Scarlet, which uh, was written in March, April 1886. And in, in that, we can see many echoes of the, of the former. And I've just mentioned there that uh, Conan Doyle's marriage takes place around the time that this story is completed. And in fact, the location of his marriage and the location of Uncle Jeremy's household bear a very strong connection. Yeah, in, in fact, um, Dunkelthwaite, which is the, um, the fictional setting of, of uh, the story, is described as being near Ingleton, some 15 miles from Carnforth. Hmm. Uh, and this is the actual setting of, of Mason Gill, uh, which was the ancestral home of the previously mentioned Brian Charles Waller. Um, and in late 1882, early 1883, Conan Doyle's mother Mary moved from Edinburgh uh, with the two youngest Doyle daughters, Ida and Dodo, uh, to live on Mace- in Mason Gill Cottage mm. uh, on the Mason Gill estate. Um, and it's interesting, actually, Dodo, the youngest daughter, her name was Brian Mary Josephine, mm. Brian being a very strange name for a girl, but obviously for some reason named in, in honour of Brian Charles Waller. Mm. Uh, and um, as has also been mentioned, um, Conan Doyle married Louise Hawkins um, at the nearby church of St. Oswald's in Thornton and Lonsdale on the 6th of August, 1885, which is the same month that um, Conan Doyle sends Uncle Jeremy's household to Blackwoods. Mm. Um, and the name Thornton in Lonsdale uh, occurs almost in the story because the, the character John H. Thurston is referred to as Thornton. Uh, by accident, <laughs> yes. uh, which which no reader or the author himself has, has picked up on afterwards. So the the mistake was was promulgated, mm. uh, but it, it seems to indicate that that because Kendall's setting the story in Mason Gill and in that area, his his mind is very much getting the names muddled up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and on top of all this, um, Uncle Jeremy's house, uh, we don't get his actual name, but presumably it's Dunkle Freight House or Dunkle Freight Hall. Mm. Uh, you look at uh, pictures of Brian Charles Waller's own home, Mason Gill House, uh, and from the descriptions in the story, it's, it's very clearly um, meant to be essentially the same building. Mm-hmm. So it's probably worth taking a bit of time to actually talk a bit about Brian Charles Waller himself and give give some more background for, for those who are not familiar to him. Uh, the short version of the story is that Waller was the um, Doyle family's Edinburgh lodger uh, turned benefactor. And as you've indicated, Paul, he, he supported the family, but particularly Mary Doyle for nigh on um, 40 years. She would actually live at Mason Gill until 1917, um, rent free. But um, the long version is rather more shadowy, and there's a, a particularly cryptic um, reference in Conan Doyle's autobiography, Memories and Adventures, which has fascinated scholars for many years, and it, it's this. My mother had adopted the device of sharing a large house, which may have eased her in some ways, but was disastrous in others. And that's left a whole shadow of mystery around uh, the character of Waller for, um, uh, for many years. So the background is that Waller was the son of a Yorkshire landowner with this estate in Mason Gill, which is on that border of Lancashire and Westmoreland. It's pretty much the most northern westerly corner of Yorkshire, if you're looking at it on the map. His uncle was Brian Waller Proctor, a, a very famous author, playwright and poet who wrote as Barry Cornwall. Um, Proctor was at school with Peel, the future prime minister. He was uh, boxed with Tom Cribb. He knew Robert Browning. Uh, and he had two of the most celebrated Victorian novels dedicated to him, uh, Thackeray's Vanity Fair and Wilkie Collins' The Woman in White, and we'll be coming back to Wilkie Collins in a bit. Um, Brian Charles Waller was himself a poet, and his uh, first collection of poetry, The Twilight Land, and other poems came out in 1875 when he was a student of medicine at Edinburgh, uh, and probably that was the year when he first uh, met the Doyles. So in 1875, the Doyles moved from Three Science Hill Place, a rather run-down cul-de-sac, to Two Argyle Park Terrace. Uh, the rent was doubled, and uh, the excess was borne by Brian Charles Waller, then in his final year at medical school. And they lived there for another two years and then moved to the very grand 
um, Georgian building on 23 George Square, uh, at which point the, the rent doubled again. But at this time, the entirety of the rent was paid by Waller. He had, in fact, inherited the Mason Gill estate uh, in, that, in that same year. And having by then graduated from Edinburgh Medical School, Waller probably put up his plate and, and practiced in medicine out of George Square. And the Doyles with Waller lived there for the best part of four years until they moved briefly to Lonsdale Terrace, again with rent paid by Waller. And then in 1882, Waller returned to Mason Gill and took with him Mary Doyle and the two youngest daughters, Ida and Dodo, as, as you mentioned, Paul. The most tantalizing episode in the story of Waller's connection with the Doyles comes from uh, a letter which is reprinted in A Life in Letters, uh, dated April 1882, when Conan Doyle wrote to his sister Lottie that he had, quote, put the finishing touch upon Waller. I nearly frightened his immortal soul out of him. He utterly refused to fight. I made such a mess of him that he didn't leave the house for 23 days. I fancy it will make him a better fellow. We've had a sort of nominal reconciliation since then, but I don't think we'd love each other very much yet. And then in a subsequent letter, Conan Doyle wrote, Waller has cleared out of Edinburgh and I don't think we shall look upon the light of his countenance any more. So there was clearly a major bust up, but it was, you know, some, it was smoothed over to some extent because you know, three years later, Conan Doyle and Louise Hawkins marry very close to the Mason Gill estate and Brian Charles Waller is best man at the wedding. So the big question is, what does all of this mean? What was really going on with the relationship between Waller and the Doyle family, uh, and, and Mary Doyle in particular, with whom he had a friendship that lasted 40 years? And the best study of this has really been done by Owen Dudley Edwards in his book, The Quest for Sherlock Holmes, and a chapter entitled The Resident Doctor. And in that, Owen really explores a number of different angles on, on Waller. The first angle is that Waller was the cuckoo in the nest. Um, and Conan Doyle came to resent him. And, and you can see um, elements of that in the story of Waller. You can imagine it that as Waller's influence rose with the family, Charles Doyle's was in decline um, because it was during these years with Waller as lodger that Charles Doyle's alcoholism came to a head. He lost his job. He was sent to a, a, a center for the treatment of alcoholics before eventually being admitted to um, mental institutions. Uh, meanwhile, Waller's picking up the bills. It was Waller who encouraged Conan Doyle to take up medicine. Um, and even though there was, you know, only six years gap between Conan Doyle and Brian Charles Waller, you do get the feeling that he's playing almost a paternal influence. Um, and another idea that that Owen Dudley Edwards has, has explored is the idea that Mary Doyle and Brian Charles Waller were in a relationship. Um, and this was exacerbated by that fact, as you point out, Paul, that, you know, the youngest daughter has the first name Brian, but it's not really that uncommon that. Um, no, I mean it might it might just be a, a thank you for the financial help. You, you, it's, you can interpret these things any way you like, really. Yeah, and and we know that Conan Doyle gets Conan from his great uncle Michael Conan. Mm. Um, you know, there's a you know it could be recognition of Waller's role as a benefactor. And, and in fact, while Mary Doyle was resident at the Mason Gill estate, Waller did marry in later life. And um, there was some suggestion that Waller's wife resented Mary Doyle's presence a little. Um, but um, it could just simply be that Mary Doyle was a, a close confidant. And then Owen has another suggestion, which is that Waller might have harbored affection for Conan Doyle's older sister, Annette, who left Edinburgh to become a governess in Portugal in 1879. Owen draws attention to a late Waller poem published after Annette's death called uh, Annette's Music, which is laden with loss and regret. It's a very sad poem. And then there is this remarkable suggestion that Owen Dudley Edwards makes that Waller might have been responsible for Charles Doyle's admission into a mental hospital, possibly with Conan Doyle's help, because we know that two doctors would have needed to sign the admission certificate. There's some suggestion in Conan Doyle's fiction that that might be part of what's going on here because you have two stories that are, are closely related to this where Waller features, again, uh, arguably, one of them is the surgeon of Gastafel, which similarly is set around Mason Gill, uh, albeit uh, under a different name. And um, the other is the Beetle Hunter, in which um, uh, a young doctor is duped into essentially s signing away a man's life into uh, into a mental mental institution. So, 
you know, there are lots of different interpretations for Brian Charles Waller, and he remains this fascinating figure at the heart of this formative period in Conan Doyle's life. It was obviously a very difficult relationship. Is it? Is mm. the, the fact that that he's so important in, in this formative time in Conan Doyle's life, and then is not mentioned once by name no. in Conan Doyle's autobiography is is rather telling. We have the letter that you've quoted um, on on Doyle's bust up with with Waller, which could be interpreted the way the the language is. It could be interpreted to be a physical fight or be purely kind of metaphorical mm. um, and that, that he's just frightened Waller uh, very, very badly and shaken him up in, in, in that sense rather than shaking him up physically. Um, but it, it's obviously a very difficult and complex relationship. So he, he's closely involved with the with, with the Doyle family until 1917 when Mary Doyle moves uh, it, into the, 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 the south of England. Um, but his influence is, is obviously there. It's been very strong. He is. Uh, you said earlier about a paternal relationship. It's almost as well like a, like an older brother. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the way he's 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 pushing Arthur into doing this and and, and persuading him almost into the um, into becoming a medical student because the Doyle family have no history of, uh, of science. They're an artistic family. Yes. Yeah. And then suddenly there's some decides to become a, a, a doctor so he, his influence is, is very strong in the background but unfortunately we will never know the truth at all because Wallace's papers were destroyed after his death yeah so all we can do is speculate mm. and he 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 lived longer than Conan Doyle he died a few years after I think he died in 1932 and it's amazing to think that that comment in Memories and Adventures will have come out in Wallace's lifetime I do wonder what he would have made of that sentence had he had he been bothered to read uh, read mm. Conan Doyle's autobiography. But but as you say, I mean, there, there are lots of connections there, and there are direct connections between Waller and Uncle Jeremy's household. And there, there are three really. The the first is the location and uh, the fact that this is a proxy for Mason Girl. The second is potentially the character of Uncle Jeremy himself, who is wandering around the house. Uh, writing his great epic poetry. And in fact, in later life, Wallow did go on to publish uh, epic poetry. And, and the third is a direct appearance, essentially, in the story. Right at the end of Uncle Jeremy's household, you have a very convenient letter arrives, uh, which gives a bit of a background e- explanation. And that is attributed to Mr. B.C. Haller. It's barely a disguise. Yeah. So going back to that, that early letter that Conan Doyle wrote to Mary Doyle in 1885, you know, the doctor's comments... Um, can be interpolated in clean copy. You know, it's quite possible that one of the commentaries from from Waller was, you know, explain what's going on here, please, and that's why you get this rather clumsy additional last few paragraphs to the story where the everything is everything is revealed. So lots of personal influences on uh, the story of Uncle Jeremy's household, but there are also literary influences, and one of them is um, very obvious, I think, which is Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. Yeah, the, the Moonstone is is obviously very influential upon Conan Doyle generally at, at, at this time. Um, I mean, the, the the book itself had been published in 1868 to to great acclaim, and and is often regarded as the first great detective novel mm. in, in the English literature. Uh, and it is quite clear that Conan Doyle had read it and learned from it. Um, and at, at this time, in particular. Uh, Uncle Jeremy's household could be regarded really as as, as the, the first of what you could term Conan Doyle's Moonstone trilogy. Yeah. Uh, so you've got Uncle Jeremy's household in 1885, followed by the Mystery of Clumber in 1888, and then the Sign of the Four in 1890. All of which clearly draw on on the the influence of the Moonstone. Uh, they all feature uh, vengeance from India. Uh, which, which which crosses the oceans uh, back to Britain, mm. and those three stories do feel like they're different renditions of the same tale, aren't they? That you get that Clumber feels like it's a step on from Uncle Jeremy's household, and Sign of Four is the next is the next iteration of the same tale. There's a there's a very strong connection between all three of them. Yes, it's, it's almost like he's experimenting, and, and each story they they're, they're they're all great in their own way. But you can feel them getting better. You can see this is a writer maturing. Absolutely, as, yeah. as you read them, and, and the, the sign of the four 
uh, is the apogee and and is is I certainly regard it as one of one of the best shows. Yeah, absolutely. Series. Um, but you, you've also got within Uncle Jeremy's household, there's almost direct clues to the Moonstone. <laughs> um, the, 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 the governor's character is called Miss Warrender. Uh, and the heroine of the Moonstone is Miss Rachel Verinder. The, mm. the names are too close to be coincidental. Um, and the, there's also the the incident which happens in Dunkelthwaite Village, where where Miss Warrender finds this this wandering Indian um, in in this this out of the way Yorkshire hamlet. Uh, and and Conan Doyle himself in the story writes he he says this is like the incident of the wandering Malay in in Thomas De Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Yeah, uh, but it is also very very similar to the, the 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 Indian supposed conjurers who turn up in in Frizinghall in in the Moonstone. It, it's a very similar sort of uh, sort of incident. Mm. Um, and then we, we we've talked as well about um, the the epilogue to Uncle Jeremy's household. By the by, the omniscient Orientalist B. C. Haller, <laughs> uh, and again, that's very similar to um, the epilogue of, of the Moonstone, uh, where the the Orientalist Mister Murthwaite just happens to be wandering through the part of India where the Moonstone is restored to the god which it was stolen from in the first place, and there's, there's explanations and, and wrappings up. So the the influence of the Moonstone is 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 massive on this story. And there are other themes in the Moonstone that start to come through in Uncle Jeremy's household. So this idea of um, the uh, the English household that that descends into disarray in the Moonstone. Verinda uh, Verinda uh, inherits this um, cursed Indian diamond. You get this theme of um, precious jewels and gems and 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 the curse that is attached to them, which reappears in in stories like Sign of Four, but also to some extent maybe the Six Napoleons. Possibly even the blue carbuncle, um, the, these sort of stories as well. And then you get uh, also this this really important theme of inheritance. And you spotted a really interesting um, parallel between um, uh, Miss Warrender's inheritance and Copperthorne's activity and what Copperthorne is trying to trying to do. Yeah, you, you've got a kind of strange um, double plot going on. Um, one of them. Is, is is Miss Miss Warrender has been deprived of of, of her inheritance um, as as an Indian princess uh, uh, on the, on the subcontinent, but the, the the other plot that's going on in Uncle Jeremy's household is is Copperthorne, the secretary, mm. is plotting to oust uh, Thurston from Uncle Jeremy's will and thereby steal Thurston's inheritance. In, in that sense, you know, a classic Gothic storyline so mm. you've got this this kind of twin theme of inheritance r- running alongside each other mm. and and think of the these themes of of, of cursed treasure and, and curses from 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 the mysterious east as it mm. were mm. um you can see uh, a sophisticated progression in in conan Doyle's storytelling throughout the these these three stories of, of uncle jeremy Mystery of Clumber and Sign of the Four, whereas in, in the first, it's it's kind of this, this almost straightforward double Gothic inheritance story. Clumber, it's it's vengeance for, for the murder of an Indian holy man. Hmm. Um, but then in the Sign of the Four, it becomes very complicated because you have this cursed treasure, but the cursed treasure has been stolen by, by Jonathan Small and his three Indian associates, and it is then stolen from Jonathan Small by Major Sholto, who also betrays his confederate, Morstan. Mm. Uh, and then you have Small trying to get the treasure back that isn't his in the first place. It's, it's an extremely complicated and convoluted plot, which constantly turns things on their head. Mm, uh, there's another inheritance in there now, I think about it as well, which is Mary Morstan's inheritance, mm. um, which again is complicated by all the connection with the Sholtos and what, they, what they've been doing and what they know. Um, so you're right, it gets more elaborate as as those three stories progress and in all three of the stories that we've connected we get gothic tropes um uh, perhaps none quite so unsubtly as we get in some of uncle jeremy's household particularly around the character of copperthorne himself uncle jeremy's secretary who we hear is constantly following him around um conan doyle uses the word amanuensis nine times to describe copperthorne it's clearly the word of the month 
Um, and uh, but but Copperthorn is is described in a whole variety of different ways to really sum up his nature as a as a gothic villain. Yeah, if, if you look throughout the story, you can you find um, quotes like uh, this one. Uncle Jeremy spends his day trotting about the rooms while Copperthorn stalks behind him like the monster in Frankenstein, <laughs> with notebook and pencil jotting down the words of wisdom as they drop from his lips. There's a lovely piece of sarcasm <laughs> in there as yeah. well. Or, or later you have, with his tall, gaunt figure towering above her and the spasmodic motions of his long arms, he might have been some great bat fluttering over a victim. Uh, and then there's a, a, another incident later on where Copperthorn is seen, he's just he's almost leering through the library window. As he looked in at me through the open window, a mocking smile played about his thin lips as though he would have liked to have taunted me with this display of his power. With the sun shining in behind him, he might have been a demon in a halo. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful phrase there, and it, it's kind of mixing the sacred and the profane. Mm. There's a wonderful quote later where they're describing um, um, Copperthorn's sudden appearance out of nowhere, and um, it says, uh, "With its corpse-like pallor, the head might have been one which had been severed from his from his shoulders," which again has the sort of connotations of John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Um, but he Conan Doyle is is he's not just choosing one Victorian Gothic monster there; he's choosing all of them. He's throwing them all into the mix for Copperthorn. And and, and on Copperthorn, um, what we were discussing earlier about Brian Charles Waller, we we've mentioned that you know, he he could possibly be an influence behind Uncle Jeremy. He certainly is the influence between, behind BC Haller. Hmm. Um, but there could be elements of, of Brian Charles Waller in Copperthorn as well. He's, he's this manipulative Eminence Grise who's, hmm. who's manipulating Uncle Jeremy and his family for, for his own ends. And this, this could be uh, very telling about, about Conan Doyle's view towards Waller in the mid-1880s. Eight, hmm. But Copperthorn isn't the only um, focus of gothic mystery and suspicion in this story. The, the other main character is the governess herself, is Miss Warrender. Yes, Miss Warrender is, is a very interesting character. Um, she's a mixed-race Anglo-Indian um, of, of a very sort of mysterious and exotic background. And, and she she's used almost as bait to tempt Lawrence um, to come and visit his friend Thurston. Um, so presumably Thurston knows that Lawrence has an eye for the ladies. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, like, um, it's like the Holmes and Watson thing when, when it comes to... Um, to, to this sort of subject, but we'll get on to Holmes and Watson later. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, uh, Thurston says in his initial letter, by the way, I think I mentioned the brunettish governess to you. I might throw her out as bait to you if you retain your taste for ethnological studies. Oh she is the child of an Indian chieftain whose wife was an Englishwoman. He was killed in the mutiny fighting against us and his estate being seized by government. His daughter, then 15, was left almost destitute. Some charitable German merchant in Calcutta adopted her, it seems, and brought her over to Europe with him, together with his own daughter. The latter died, and then Miss Warrender, as we call her, after her mother, answered Uncle's advertisement, and here she is. So we we later um, get a little bit more detail, and uh, again, we, 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 we stumble on this over Conan Doyle's choice of names, um, when when uh, her background is 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 gone into in detail, and her father was Ahmed Genghis Khan, a semi-independent chieftain somewhere in the central provinces. He was a bit of a heathen fanatic, in spite of his Christian wife, and became chummy with the Nana and mixed himself up in the cornpool business. So government came down heavily on him. So mm. to to a, a, a Victorian readership, this is saying an awful lot. Uh, um, because the, 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 the whole the, the Cornwall business, which, which I'll, I'll go into in, in a bit more detail uh, later on, uh, was a, 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 one of the most shocking incidents of, of, uh, of the Indian mutiny. So Miss Warrender is of a tainted background very clearly from that. Um, but in a way, this, this, this background almost, almost adds to her allure, to, mm. um, to, to the readership and, and to, uh, to Lawrence. Um, so, so she's being set up as this this uh, alluring femme fatale. Yeah, I think once they set up that she is of mixed race, that there is this central 
um, tension between is she is she her mother's daughter or her father's mm-hmm. daughter? Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, as as the story progresses, we discover she's very much her father's daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a it, it it's interesting how <laughs> Thurston basically pimps her out at the beginning to try and get <laughs> Lawrence to come to see. Um, but again, it's that exoticism, isn't it? It's the Arabian Nights fantasy of the of the of the Orient, and Conan Doyle was mm. incredibly interested in you know in all of this stuff at this time. This was going through a lot of his writing. Yeah, it's it's um, so at, at this time he's becoming heavily involved with the Portsmouth Literary and Philosophical Society, um, uh, and the, the president of, of, of that particular group is uh, a retired um, British Army officer who spent time in India, um, Major General Alfred Drayson. Uh, he's also um, an, an a, astronomer of note, but he's very interested in the occult, uh, so he's beginning to to actually. Uh, teach Conan Doyle uh, about to invite him to, um, to to meetings on subjects like spiritualism and, and theosophy. Um, and Conan Doyle is, is also reading the, 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 the textbooks of the time. But unfortunately, uh, in his head, it all becomes rather mixed up. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we get the, the results of this in Uncle Jeremy's household and, and the mystery of Clumber in particular. Um, where where we have his his descriptions of of, of Indian religion leave something to de- to be desired, shall we say? Mm. And and it's probably through Drayson that Conan Doyle was introduced to the Boys Own Paper, which then published Uncle Jeremy's Household. Yes, because because Drayson had had written you know, improving articles in in that hmm. magazine. But but for all that Thurston is 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 almost dismissive of, of Miss Warren, just seeing her as 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 a, essentially an exotic pretty face who looks after the children. She's actually she is the central character of the story, and she outwits the lot of them. Yeah, she does. She she escapes at the end. They think she's escaped to London, um, and again, it's another um, echo of the Moonstone, isn't it? Where the the there's there's devastation left behind in the English household um, as the travellers from the east disappear back once again into into the distance. <laughs> and the character of Warrender is inextricably linked with the Indian mutiny, and the, the mutiny itself um, casts an incredibly long shadow on this tale and indeed many uh, Conan Doyle tales, as, as we discussed with Shrabani in the last podcast. I mean, the Indian mutiny casts a huge shadow and uh, over over Victorian Britain. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's the psychological scar um, that, that it left, and, and references in <clears throat> in literature to it mm. uh, are almost always pointed. Mm. Uh, and, and this, in particular, where we we find out that that Miss Warren's father was was mixed up with with the the Nana and the Cornpool business. Um, Conan Doyle's original readership would have understood that reference I- immediately, and and it refers to uh, the siege of of Cawnpaw in um, summer eighteen fifty seven, uh, when the British garrison uh, was 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 forced to surrender uh, to the uh, the Maharaja of of Bitor, the 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 so called the Nana Sahib, uh, who is mm. um, Dondu Pant. Uh, son of the Peshwa Bajira II, and he he had genuine grievances against mm. East India Company. They had deprived him again of, of his inheritance, yeah, uh, and things that were due to him. Um, but unfortunately, uh, after the surrender of the British garrison, there were three separate massacres uh, which occurred, and and whether the Nana Sahib ordered them or whether it was troops out of hand, he was ultimately the man in charge of the situation. Uh, and was 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 blamed for this, so that we've got Miss Warrender's father mixed up with him. It is it is saying that that um, th- this man was was mixed up in a dreadful business and and probably culpable. Yeah. In a dreadful business, um, and and the, the mutiny itself, uh, Conan Doyle does tend to use it as a symbol for betrayal. He, he does it here. Um, it it re- recurs in in the sign of the four, which is also a story about betrayal, where where the actual treasure comes into the hands of Jonathan Small and his confederates uh, during the siege of Agra. 
Mm. Uh, and then again, we also have betrayal as the theme for in The Crooked Man, mm. the, the Sherlock Holmes story. But interestingly enough, in that, the betrayal is between two British soldiers. Yes. Um, yeah. And and the the Indians aren't particularly involved there, but nevertheless, betrayal is is central to the plot. In the case of the Crooked Man, there's that other trope in Anglo-Indian Gothic of uh, the corrupting influence of the the East. Um, in many Conan Doyle stories, people are already pretty corrupt before they go out to uh, to India. But in the case of mm. um, the Crooked Man, there's almost um, um, the 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 incidents built up around. Uh, around the mutiny and and um, the characters themselves being corrupted by the situation and the circumstance as well. Um, mm, there, there is the particular strong hint that that, that Barclay, the future Colonel Barclay, is actually mixed up with the mutineers. Yeah, and not only was Warrender's father mixed up with the mutiny, he was also mixed up with the thuggy cult. Yeah, the the the, the thuggy cult. Uh, if, if you can call it such, um, is, is something that has become mythologized mm. uh, over, the, over the years. Um, but it looks to have, have, have existed in, in India for quite some time before the, before the British arrived. It has been misunderstood, and th- there are academic debates over whether Thuggy itself even existed, but that's, you know, that's irrelevant for our discussion. Mm. Um, but the, the essential background is is that they they were gangs of of robbers who took to the roads um and and gave their their, their highway robbery uh, an element of, of of religious verisimilitude really mm. by devoting themselves to the the hindu goddess kali um and they, they were unique amongst um indian highway robbers in that they, they not only robbed they they inevitably murdered their victims, um, and they, it was done in a, in a very ritualized way, usually by by strangling them with 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 the, the scarf they carried, called the rumal, uh, and then the bodies would be immediately buried in in a very specific way. Hmm. Um, and th- this was was discovered um, by by the British uh, in the eighteen twenties, almost by accident, with the discovery of of, of graves. And, and one particular officer, uh, William Sleeman, later Sir William Sleeman, uh, made it his life's work. To, to to undo the the the, the, the thug network, um, and he became known as Thuggy Sleeman. Mm. Um, but he was he was the most famous. But but um, there were other British officers involved, and they had a whole raft of of, of uh, Indian policemen working under them. Um, and over time, they would captured thugs uh, would be turned into uh, in, into informants or uh, approvers, as, as they were called. So the network was 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 closed down bit by bit. So by by the 1840s, it, it had largely been um, eradicated, but but pockets obviously still existed. And while there's the worship of the Hindu god Kali, this was actually not a mono mono religious organisation, was it? This was a no. It was it was, it was mostly Hindus, hmm. um, but there were you could find uh, Muslims and Sikhs. Amongst their ranks as well, but the you know, the central deity involved was was a, was a Hindu deity. But the the crime committed was largely motivated for material gain. Yes, yes, they were they, they were highway robbers, uh, and there, there was a, a season they would go out, uh, befriend other travellers, uh, and this this is um, you know the, the thugs who were known as the deceivers because they would befriend other travellers and and then murder them and and rob. They would pick their targets. Um, and there were the thugs who were very skilled uh, in vagling their way into into people's trust, and that is the way they operated. But but their primary purpose was was robbery and gain. Yeah, and that's where Conan Doyle sort of well, there's a lot of misrepresentation in the story, but but in particular the 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 unfortunate fate of poor Ethel, who is um, one of the children in her care. We later discover she was supposedly. Um, uh, sacrificed to to Kali, mm. I think, by by uh, by Miss Warrender in uh, in pursuit of her 
her father's legacy to some extent. Yes, um, and this this plays this sort of action plays no part in in thug philosophy whatsoever. But um, it, it plays a big part in if you're going to write a gothic thriller. Um, and, and this is what gives Copperthorne his power. He witnesses this this, this incident, uh, and then we find out later that that the um, the daughter of the German missionary has also been strangled by Miss Warrender. For, for the same reason but you know she gets no financial gain from this so it, it's it's a complete misrepresentation of, of, of what Puggy is and, mm. and also when we're talking earlier about um, Conan Doyle mixing up his, his Indian religions <laughs> we, we have a, 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 a prime example of that uh, when when Miss Warrender is discovered um, I was mad I was mad she ejaculated in a broken voice I had prayed much to Buddha and to the great Buwani <laughs> that's, that's Buwani is Kali under a, a different name and it seemed to me that in this land of unbelievers it would be a great and glorious thing for me a lonely woman to act up to the teachings of my great father uh, it's complete misrepresentation the idea that the, the thugs worshipped Buddha mm. is, is completely um, <laughs> Off, off the off the record. This is this is just nonsense. Yeah, and like we said with Shrabani last time in Mystery of Clumber, you've got the the, the killer Buddhists of Mystery of Clumber as well. As, <laughs> as, as, we have another killer Buddhist, supposedly. It, it, it's it's just this is this is the um, it, it's it's classic sort of Western mixing up of, of of Indian religion and this this kind of oh it's all the same, isn't it? Almost um, and and. As we mentioned earlier, this, this time in his life, um, Conan Doyle was was studying the occult and theosophy. Yeah, uh, and theosophy was this this cod Indian mishmash religion mm. made up by Madame Blavatsky, which, which <laughs> threw everything in, in, into the into the cauldron. And Conan Doyle's doing a similar thing here, but for for the purposes of just writing a gothic thriller. Yeah, I think you can see the long tail of that in some of his later spiritualist writing as well, where he's mm. picking and choosing mm. from different disciplines. And you gave a paper on this at the uh, one of the Edinburgh Works conferences, mm. and there was a question afterwards about why was it that Conan Doyle, you know, was really great on his historical detail, but not necessarily so great on on getting these religions and and uh, uh, and this background correct. And I think the answer to that is, if you're writing historical fiction you're trying to tell a historical story. You know, you have to get the details of Edward the Black Prince right, and you have to get the details of the Battle of Sedgemoor. But in this, this, this is the background. This is context. This is um, character and flavor. And it's a bit like, um, you know, if you look at great artists like John Singer Sargent painting a portrait, the eyes and the face are always detailed. And the further out that you get from the face, the more <laughs> vague and, uh, you know, um, expressionistic um, the strokes become, and in a similar kind of way, you know that the, the heart of this story is not about Warrender's uh, background and the accuracy of uh, of all that stuff. It's a gothic tale where they it's the bogeyman of the East appearing uh, in here. So he Conan Doyle doesn't need to be getting the details uh, exactly right to to be able to to make the story work. But nevertheless, he was really interested in the detail because there is a direct reference to one of the principal figures in. The history and the 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 story of Thuggy, which is um, Meadows Taylor. Yeah, I mean, you you get this this whole idea at, at first of of the way Conan Doyle presents the, the the thugs when 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 Lawrence finds out about Miss Warrender's background, you, you get this, uh, the thugs I had heard of the wild fanatics of that name who were found in the central part of India and whose distorted religion represents murder as being the highest and purest of all the gifts which a mortal can offer to the creator. Again, total misunderstanding. <laughs> I remember an account of them, which I had read in the works of Colonel Meadows Taylor, of their secrecy, their organization, their relentlessness, and the terrible power which their homicidal craze has over every other mental or moral faculty. This, this, it, it is, it's mm -hmm. pure Gothic nonsense. Um, and he mentions Meadows Taylor. It was very interesting because Meadows Taylor was, uh, he was a British officer, um, political and military officer um, in Hyderabad. Uh, and he had actually been involved in the detection of, of Thuggy himself. He was in, some would argue, he actually discovered this before Sleeman, uh, but he was distracted by his other uh, police and political duties. 
Um, he did write an article in 1833 on Thuggee um, for the new monthly magazine. Uh, and this article was read by uh, the, the, the novelist and politician Edward Bulwer-Lytton, <laughs> uh, who we mentioned before, the author of The Coming Race. Um, and he suggested to Meadows Taylor that uh, it would make a, a damn good subject for a novel. Mm. Um, and in 1839, Taylor did just that with, with um, his, his triple-decker uh, Confessions of a Thug. Um, which is, it has its gothic elements, but it's, it's actually quite a, an interesting, sympathetic portrayal. That, that I mean, it's full of horror. It's full of, yeah. full of murder and mayhem. Um, but he, because he'd been out in it, he understood this far more, and he'd investigated. So it, it's it's actually not um, not the pot boiler. It, yeah, it's it's often presented to be. It, it is more sympathetic, and and the, um, the 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 thug at the heart of it, who's turned um, approver or informer, uh, Amir Ali, could more readily be described as an anti-hero than a villain. Mm. There's a, he's he's quite a sympathetic character. He becomes a thug because his parents have been murdered by the thugs, and, and he's adopted by them. Um, so it, it's a it's a pretty complex story. Um, and Conan Doyle had obviously read Confessions of a Thug, and he he got all the thug argo and slang from this novel. Um, but he didn't take Meadows Taylor's knowledge uh, of, of the background and, and, and use that. He just used the background of, of the thuggy itself. Yeah. And then brought in the more, the more gothic uh, exploitation elements. Yeah. And how popular was that novel? It was hugely popular, uh, very successful. Queen Victoria, young Queen Victoria, absolutely loved it. And there's a story of her almost stood by the printing presses waiting for the last pages to be run off <laughs> so she could, she could finish the story. Um, and, and Meadows Taylor himself was a, was a figure of some interest. And, and um, in 1877, and Conan Doyle may have seen this, there were two articles on Meadows Taylor appeared, um, one of which was in Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine. <laughs> And the other of which appeared in the Edinburgh Review. Mm. So it's, it's very likely he would actually have read these articles as well to get background on, on Meadows Taylor. So, yeah, it, it, it seems pretty clear from his references that he, he, he was genned up on, on, on Meadows Taylor and his, his work. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's often forgotten that um, Meadows Taylor did write other novels. He, he's, he's one of these authors who's known for, for, for one book. But he, he did actually write uh, five more Indian novels, uh, Tipu Sultan, Tara, Ralph Darnell, Sita, and A Noble Queen. But, but none of them, unfortunately, uh, repeated the success of Confessions of a Thug for him. And it wasn't just Conan Doyle who was influenced by uh, Confessions of a Thug. No, it, it was a very, uh, very influential novel, generally, and and uh, had obviously caught the eye of the uh, the French uh, writer and political activist Eugène Sue, mm. the author of the Mysteries of Paris, which had been a, a huge phenomenon in itself. Uh, but in eighteen forty four forty five, he wrote a, a, a sprawling novel uh, called uh, Le Juif Errant, the, the Wandering Jew, which featured a, a, a thug character. Um, called Ferengia, um, and he picked that up from Sleeman because Ferengia was one of uh, Sleeman's main appro- approvers and Amir Ali sort of character. Um, and, and Ferengia in The Wandering Jew is, is almost the bodyguard to this uh, a romantic character called Prince Jamal. Uh, and both of these characters, interestingly enough, are Anglo-Indian. They're both of mixed race. And this carries over into Miss Warrender. I'm quite sure that Condor had read The Wandering Jew mm. um, and taken ideas from that as, as, as well. And we know that Conan Doyle did read uh, French novels in the original yeah. language. Yeah. Uh, and The Wandering Jew was itself a cultural phenomenon. So I'm pretty certain he will have read that as well. And, and perhaps some of the more sensationalist elements from that novel were what found their way into Uncle Jeremy's household. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting to note um, Eugène Sue's interest in, in Thuggy. Uh, I mean, p- part of his purpose as well was political, to point out the, in, the, the iniquities of, of, of British rule in India. Um, but uh, obviously the, uh, the, the sensationalist elements of the Thug story appeal to him. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's 
also quite fascinating to note that uh, in 1909, Uncle Jeremy's household uh, was issued as a book in France and translated by René Lacouillère um, under the rather too revelatory but rather more exciting title of Notre Dame de la Mort, Our Lady of Death. <laughs> That's a great title, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> One of the most interesting uh, emergences of, of, of Tuggy in um, Victorian culture, or, or possible emergences, is um, it surrounds uh, Charles Dickens's last unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which was published in 1870. Uh, and the debate about how Dickens intended to finish this novel has, has gone on for, for years. And, and one of the theories... Um, about it is that John Jasper, the supposed villain, who is always wearing a scarf, uh, is, for some reason, a, a devotee of Thuggy. <laughs> <laughs> and there is something about the um, the Thuggy cult that really has captured the popular imagination because you keep seeing it reappear um, for generations in different media, different books, different films. Um, you know, we've had... Uh, the, the the one I'm thinking of immediately is this um, rather lurid 1959 movie, The Stranglers of Bombay, um, which, as its name suggests, goes in for the <laughs> rather more murderous activities of the thuggy. But but that's that's just one of several um, other uh, examples. Yeah, you, you've got, uh, for instance, 1952, John Masters, who was uh, one of the um, 20th century authors on, on British India, he was the, the, the author of Buwana Junction, um, wrote, wrote a novel called The Deceivers uh, uh, about the, the, the thugs and, and, and their eradication. Um, there's sensationalist elements in it, but it, it's, it's also... It, Got a, a, a serious underbelly, as it, as it yeah. were, um, as you'd expect from, from Masters. That too was that was made into a film in 1988 with a pre-James Bond, Pierce Brosnan, uh, Good Lord, starring. Uh, th- there's also been a, a more recent novel, um, The Strangler Vine by M. J. Carter, mm. uh, which again takes a, a, a more modern, almost revisionist uh, look at the uh, the whole thing. Um, and then, of course, the, 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 and what most people will probably be familiar with is the 1984 film Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, <laughs> which quite definitely takes the, uh, the less informed, populist, sensationalist approach to uh, to Tuggy and um, very entertaining, but but um, certainly nothing to learn from. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> And I suppose we should be grateful that Sherlock Holmes didn't encounter the thuggies. Uh, we we mustn't forget, Mark, though, that that uh, Holmes demonstrates a knowledge of thuggy in the film Murder by Decree, where he carries a, a loaded scarf. He does a loaded scarf. I've forgotten about that. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes he does make a, a sort of appearance in Uncle Jeremy's household, in that you get a couple of characters that feel very familiar. You have the somewhat anonymous hero narrator Hugh Lawrence who is a medical student who lives in Baker Street um, and his friend uh, is John H. Thurston um, who is uh, described as being a chemist. Yes Lawrence says of him my friend was ardently devoted to chemistry and spent his days happily among his test tubes and solutions Uh, and he talks of one particular incident he was in his little laboratory at the time and was deeply immersed in a series of manipulations and distillations which ended in the production of an evil-smelling gas, which set us both coughing and choking. This this sounds very like the goings-on uh, within the walls of 221B Baker Street. Yeah, possibly also the Devil's Foot. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, but, you know, they're not quite... Um, Lawrence and Thurston are not quite, as you can tell, um, Holmes and Watson. They're, they're all, the, all of the characteristics are sort of mixed up, aren't they? So, so um, And they don't have the, uh, the personality. Of, of either of the later characters. That's uh, um, well, one interesting thing, uh, again, with, with, with Lawrence is talking about Thurston, also John Thurston was never a very observant man. So yeah. <laughs> he's certainly not a proto-Holmes in that respect. Yeah. And it is quite incredible to think about how anonymous these two characters are. I mean, Thurston is actually Uncle Jeremy's nephew and his heir himself, and yet Thurston basically appears at the beginning to, to bring Lawrence into the story 
uh, raises his acid-stained finger at one point and uh, and otherwise sort of disappears out of the story a bit uh, later, whereas Lawrence is a sort of everyman figure uh, way into the story and, and is a bit dense, to be perfectly honest, as well. There's lots going on around him. And at the At the end of the story, Lawrence thinks that Uncle Jeremy's life is in danger and it's left to Lawrence to decide what to do about this. And actually, most of the time, he's hanging around thinking, you know, well, I'll just let this play out a bit longer and see if Uncle Jeremy gets into danger. They're very odd character types, Thurston and Lawrence. They don't really go very far. And I think Owen Dudley Edwards has said that, you know, Conan Doyle was still at this time learning how best to split the companionship for maximum effectiveness, is what what he said. Um, The other other thing Owen notes is that um, the name John H. Thurston may come from Herbert Thurston, who was uh, Conan Doyle's former Stonyhurst classmate who became a Jesuit priest and they actually had in later life a series of outspoken exchanges on the topic of um of spiritualism but as 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 Owen suggested if if Thurston is indeed um influenced by Herbert Herbert Thurston uh, then uh, it, Herbert might well be the uh, the H in John H Watson but but we also uh, can note with with Thurston that, that um John Watson's billiards partner it's called Thurston. Yeah. As well. And Thurston's was a famous manufacturer of billiards tables. So <laughs> another possible origin of, of the name with, with Conan Doyle's fondness for billiards. Yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and Gibson and Green in their uncollected stories felt that there was, uh, quote, a rather exaggerated association with Sherlock Holmes. But I, I kind of feel that there there are quite strong echoes here. You I, th- can... I think it's... It's very strong, really, because you you look at the, the the Baker Street, John H. Thurston. It's a, and and as you've mentioned earlier, Mark, in the next year he's writing Study in Scarlet. Yeah, yeah. Nine months later, he's put pen to paper on Study mm. in Scarlet, and these things are. And we've seen in previous podcasts that you know names and um, tropes carry through from Conan Doyle's work into the next. Mm. Um, as uh, you know, particularly in these early early works in the early eighteen eighties. So that brings us to the end of this episode. And uh, if you want to read the show notes, you can find them at doingsofdoyle.com. Uh, and please follow us at Doings of Doyle on Twitter. And if you're enjoying the podcast, there are a couple of things you might want to do. You could write a rating or review on your podcaster of choice. Um, or if you want to help us meet the cost of the podcast, you can always sponsor us on Patreon uh, for as little as a pound a month. Now, next time, what have we got planned, Paul? Next time, we're going to return to Baker Street proper for an in-depth examination of the resident patient. Excellent. So look forward to that, and we'll see you next month. Until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. And he, he, he lived longer than Conan Doyle. He died a few years after... Conan Doyle, uh, I think he died in 1832. Um, and uh, sorry, yeah, he di- <laughs> he died. He died before he was born. Absolutely. One of the other peculiar things about Brian Charles. <laughs>